All right, it's connecting, and here we go. What's up, YouTube? Today, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Andrew Hollingsworth, uh, a, a longtime friend of mine. We were members at the same church in New Orleans for a while, so that's probably the coolest thing uh, that you need to know about him. But also, he's an adjunct professor at Bruton Parker College and at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. One of the smartest guys I know. He's written. He has a book coming out on Pannenberg, which I recommend everyone also listen to his podcast. Um, at the London Lyceum, where he talks about Pannenberg. And um, we're also going to be talking about his book that you'll see in the middle of this video, uh, God in the Labyrinth. Labyrinth. And uh, we're going to be talking about taking a semiotic approach to theology. So how's it going, Andrew? Did I get anything wrong? No, that's it, man. Just, uh, that's right. And it's Labyrinth. But yeah, that's it. Okay, good. Um, I hope this stream is coming through, guys. If it's not, let me know, because all I see is a picture of my face, like, halfway asleep. <laughs> so, uh, but Andrew, man, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, why don't you begin by telling our listeners, what is semiotics? Right. So semiotics, uh, to kind of break it down and sum it up, is it's the philosophical discipline that reflects on the nature of signs, sign systems, and all things pertaining to signification. So if you think of it as anything that signifies or points to something else, that's a sign. Mm -hmm. And semiotics is the discipline that reflects on signs, reflects on signs. Um, I guess a great way uh, to, to explain more technically what a sign is, is a sign is anything that represents or signifies something else to someone in some respect or capacity. Okay, so anything that signifies. All right, you want to give us an anything. example of that? Sure. Uh, so words are the are the most common place. They're the most common sign talked about because so many philosophers and theologians are concerned with philosophy of language and what language does. I like the word phone. Like the, just the word phone. Well, it signifies something. It signifies this thing that I can never put down out of my hand. You know that I can't pull my eyes away from. Uh, smoke. If you're out hiking and you see smoke coming that signifies a fire or something else that's producing smoke. Um, the most, actually one of the original signs that was ever discussed in the history of philosophy going all the way back um, to Herak, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is the medical symptom, uh, fever. The fever signifies that something is wrong with the body. Signs are always pointing. You know, fever is never the problem in of itself, uh, but it is, um, it does point to something else being the case. So those are some examples of signs. Also uh, traffic lights, those are types of signs as well. Okay, so it seems like a simple enough concept, uh, but that obviously has developed over the history of uh, theology and philosophy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of, of signs and semiotics? Sure, so really the, the first <clears throat> becoming aware of signs goes, goes back to, to the philosopher I just mentioned um, when he was talking about medical symptoms. Um, noticing that fever is a symptom of something else. You know, a, a headache frequently is a, is a symptom of another problem. You know, when, when you're coughing or sneezing, those are symptoms of a cold, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the kind of idea. Signs were understood to be things out in nature and in the world that pointed, or, uh, that pointed to other things. Okay. Uh, in Plato, Plato talks about signs some, but he talks more specifically about language. And for the most part in the ancient world, there was a distinction between language and signs, though that, that gets cha that changes about uh, with, with St. Augustine. But for Plato, he was very much concerned with, with language and how words mean. But particularly, he's focused on names. Um, when we're reading the ancient philosophers, they're like Plato and Aristotle, they're going to be concerned primarily with names. Now, Plato was concerned that just through, and again, with his, with his rationalist uh, his agenda, that if we just reflect upon the etymology of, of words, we can come to realize how words themselves embody that which they mean, and, and that words ultimately um, reflect that which they mean um, because they reflect the forms, mm -hmm. ultimately, because they're always pulling us and pointing us back to forms. Aristotle, so for Plato, it's also important that language wasn't really conventional or arbitrary for him. It was, it was something very natural about language that that was the, the sign that words signified was somehow directly connected to the word itself. Uh, Aristotle uh, is a little bit different. And, Aristotle, and, uh, Andrew, just to make sure I'm catching on to the importance of what you're saying so that uh, when you say the words embody or, or words reflect the forms, that relation is really what's important, right? Like what does it mean to say that words embody or reflect 
um, the things they're supposed to signify? Right. So like Plato would say, for example, in the word dog, there is something innate in the word itself that connects it to dogs or the form of dog, that which it actually represents and signifies. Okay. So now Aristotle is different. Aristotle, again, being more of an empiricist, Aristotle, uh, he discusses language and, and how language signifies things in a couple of different places, but most, probably most popularly in his De Interpretation uh, or On Interpretation. He's concerned primarily with propositions and, and logic and arguments, but Aristotle's emphatic that that names, for example, that they relate uh, that they relate to things they signify arbitrarily. It's, it's just by a social convention. But for example, the reason the dogs, the, the word dog signifies a dog is because uh, a culture, a community has so designated that term to do so. Yeah. So think of it like encoding. It's been, the sign has been encoded to do mm -hmm. so. I like that. that. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. And that's, and that's been a, a very popular idea and theme um, throughout the history of semiotics. Uh, now, it's interesting for Aristotle, though, and this is where he kind of shares some similar to Plato, is that what that really what these do. So when we ask what is it the signs signify, um, Aristotle is going to talk about how it's going to what they signify and that all knowing takes place. Uh, he talks about it as the passions of the soul. Mm -hmm. And so really, so that really they're signifying some sort of inner realities of the speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what's important for this is that it comes back is that Aristotle and Plato were both emphatic that all understanding is occurring through language. Okay, so it, when I'm using these words, I'm, I mean, this might not be, this might be crude, but I'm like saying something about myself or a passion that I might have. No, so, so just not really, but it's more so, so like, for example, you know, I get remember for Plato and Aristotle, the soul, the mind, those are one and the same thing, right? Okay. So like, you know, I'm looking, when I look at my phone, when I just glance at my phone, how does my mind make sense of that? Okay. Well, the word phone. Okay. That's how it registers in my mind. Okay. So signs are always, they, they're always embodying, they're always representing passions in the soul. So, so about passions in the soul, he's talking about understanding, he's talking okay. about memories, thoughts, ideas. Okay. That's what he's talking about. It's okay. not something about me. Okay. But the, the, the point that, and the emphasis that Aristotle makes is that all human understanding is mediated through language, through words. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, this, and that's kind of a, an axiom now in semiotics and in yeah. most philosophy of language. When you look around the world, you're like, oh, it's sunny outside. Well, it's our, it's our language, our sign system that allows us to mm -hmm. understand. Makes sense. So again, um, when was, the, the Stoics and Epicureans developed signs a little bit, but nothing too, ter too terribly significant. So I'm just going to skip ahead of over them to Augustine. Okay. Uh, so in Aristotle and Plato, though, there's still this distinction between signs and language. And Plato and Aristotle are primarily concerned with language, right? Mm -hmm. So with Augustine, though, we actually have, for the first time, a an attempt at a general theory of signs. Okay. So so um, when we talk about like words, words according to Aristotle, these are signs of convention, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we can think of other conventional signs like stoplights, um, when we're heading, at, when, when when we part ways and we say peace or whatever. Yeah. Like that's a set sign. When we wave, that's a conventional sign that we've adopted from our cultures and, and so forth. But there's also other signs in the world, such as, you know, when smoke signifies a fire or mm -hmm. the fever signifies a medical symptom. There doesn't seem to be any sort of cultural convention to that. Uh, we see this in the, uh, in the lower animals as well, in the animal kingdom. For example, if a deer is out feeding and it picks up a scent of a predator, that scent represents or signifies a predator, no one has to tell that deer to run. It just instinctively knows what to do. Yeah. Um, same thing if, if there's a forest fire and animals pick up the scent of smoke, they know to flee to safety. Uh, so there are natural signs that in the way that they signify um, their objects, it isn't really hinged on, a, on any sort of cultural convention. But again, for Aristotle and Plato, these are two different things. Mm -hmm. Things in nature, those are signs. Language is its own thing. But then Augustine comes along, and Augustine says, actually, no, they're, both of these are signs. They're just signs in different ways. Mm -hmm. So he actually comes and provides our first attempt at a general theory of signs, where he says that it's, essentially that a sign is, uh, is anything that points an individual to something else. And I'm, I'm kind of blanking a little bit on the rest of his definition, um, which is sad because it's actually kind of important because his definition actually gets critiqued by Thomas and later medievals 
for being too narrow. Wait, wait. So, so you're instead of broadening out what science means, Augustine is narrowing. So he's broadening it from what Aristotle and Plato have said. Okay. But it's still not going to be broad enough, uh, as Thomas and later medievals will talk about it. So Augustine takes up the interest of science for two reasons, and he discusses science in a couple of different works, but two primarily. An early dialogue he wrote called On the Teacher, where he writes a dialogue between he and his son uh, about how we come to know things, and he talks about the importance of science for how we know things. Mm -hmm. And then later in his more popular work on Christian doctrine, and it's on Christian doctrine where you see a more matured semiotic theory, and it's where most scholars turn their attention to in Augustine. But in his On the Teacher, uh, again, Augustine's very influenced by, by certain Neoplatonic philosophers. So, but, so therefore, he's going to take up a more Stoic understanding of the sign. I know I passed over that, but for Stoics, signs... The Stoic theory of signs is more similar to Plato's theory of language, mm -hmm. that, that signs are ultimately embodying somehow the, the, the logos that just penetrates all of reality, the reason and rationality of the universe. So for the Stoics um, and for Augustine, so when, when, when we have signs, Augustine's very clear, signs point us to something. Good, okay. They're always gonna point us to something else. Okay. But however, that which they point us to was already there. Okay. Gotcha. So, like for example, you know how Plato, Plato makes the comment that as we learn, we never really learn anything new. It's just recollecting what the soul has forgotten through, in, re, through reincarnation and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So Augustine's kind of getting at that. So Augustine's going to say signs divert our attentions to objects of knowledge. But it's really only the inner teacher that gives us the knowledge itself. Okay. The signs don't actually give us any knowledge. It's the inner teacher. Now, for Augustine, that inner teacher is Christ. Okay. okay. So because, because we are made in the image of God, because we, we are rational animals, and because we do embody a form of logos, logos and the sun is the logos, because we embody that, it's through that that Christ is actually, for all people, even those who don't know him, mm -hmm. is actually giving knowledge to people of the world. Okay. Now, so now, Signs are a medium to make that happen. But Augustine also, and on the teacher, he's also explicit. We learn, we ultimately learn nothing from signs, only from the teacher. Okay, so he's kind of like at this midway point where he thinks signs are conventional in the sense that they point, uh, but at the same time, they're expressing something that is actually out there, and there's also something going on in here, I guess, you know, yeah, we're so, learning. Yeah, so he's at, he's at that point with, length, with, with the conventional signs, but he's also clear that, for example, um, while, sign, while smoke may point us to a fire, it's the teacher that brings our awareness to that and teaches us that smoke points to a fire. Okay. All right. I, I think I'm, I'm smelling what you're stepping in right now, Andrew. So let's move <laughs> on to the uh, modern yeah. fathers. <laughs> yeah. So the modern fathers is where it really gets interesting. Like I said, um, now the medievals are going to be a little crit critical of Augustine because Augustine really what he's getting at in his theory of science is he wants to be able to interpret scripture better. How do these words point to divine realities? And how does the teacher use these words to teach the inner man, so okay. to say, our souls? Gotcha. So, so he's also very interested in how this relates to the sacraments. How is it the supper and baptism yeah. point or signify these other realities? So Aquinas, when he gets to Aquinas, he's going to broaden these a little bit. And Roger Bacon is going to talk about how signs relate to the scientific method, how that's really what we're doing in science when we do experiments. We look at certain, we make observations of what experiments bring about and how those signify to us other realities. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we get to a, a there's a, there's a very pivotal figure in semiotics towards the end of the Renaissance period named John Poinsot, meaning knowing better as John of St. Thomas. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into him, but Poinsot, I do want to point out, he was the first to really develop what is called a triadic model of the sign. I'm going to talk about that a little more in a second. Mm -hmm. Up until then, signs were really con concerned with just being dyadic there was the sign itself and there was that what it signified there was the, the thing that it signified so the distinction between signs and things that was very important for augustine as well as thomas and other medievals gotcha the modern fathers so well, and and yeah. I, I if i'm if i'm following the direction you're going the question is then going to become how much metaphysical baggage i guess are we going to end up placing on signs is that kind right. of the the issue right. that's at and, stake that, that part of that does. Um, there is some metaphysical baggage for some, but that's one of the great things about uh, the modern fathers is they're going to show us how to 
we can adopt general theories of signs without having to take on excessive metaphysical baggage. Okay. The problem is, is that some of them, like with Ferdinand de Saussure, there is metaphysical baggage smuggled in that really impacts their theory of signs more than they realize. Okay, gotcha. I just want to make sure I'm following where the, where this might be going. All right, so go ahead and take, take me through sure. the modern fathers. So, so there's two there's two modern fathers of semiotics, Ferdinand de Saussure and Charles Sanders Peirce. Saussure is writing in Europe. Peirce is, an Amer is probably America's greatest and most significant, I won't say greatest, but he's probably his most significant philosopher. Many philosophers, at least Harold Peirce is that. Um, What's funny is they're writing on signs and semiotics around the same time, but there seems to be no indication that they know of each other. Okay. So it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Again, Saussure is in Europe, Peirce is in America. Okay. So Saussure is concerned with signs for one primary purpose, and that is Saussure is a professor of linguistics. He teaches linguistics. He teaches different languages. Okay. So he is trying to develop a general theory of linguistics. So he's, so he's focused primarily and essentially on language. Okay. That is his primary concern. It's not that he doesn't believe there aren't other signs out there. That's just not his concern. He's concerned with language. So Saussure comes down and he says, and he continues in this kind of dyadic frame, where he's going to say that signs are composed of two elements, a signifier and a signified. Okay. There is the sign, or think of a signifier like the sign vehicle, mm -hmm. and the signified is that thing which the sign is connected to or points to. Gotcha. These Now, the signifier and the signified, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. A signifier without a signified is not a sign, and a signified without a signifier is not a sign. Okay. You have to have both for there to be a sign. So, like, let's imagine a shape, right, like with a thousand sides, right, whatever that shape would be called. You know, that's just a sign, but it doesn't have anything to signify in reality. Well, so think of it like, let's go back to words, since the store is concerned with language, mm -hmm. the word dog. The word dog, if it doesn't signify or point to anything or communicate anything, then it's not a sign. Okay, gotcha. So maybe that's a better way to phrase this sort of, if it does not communicate, mm -hmm. not signify, but if it does not communicate, mm -hmm. okay, then it's not a sign that he's concerned with. So they're dyadic. So we have it, for example, there's the signifier like the word dog. It's a, it's a vocal expression, dog. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So what it signifies is, it's like a definition. Yeah. The reason we can communicate is because you know the definition of the word dog. Mm -hmm. Now, this is important because the signified is not a dog in reality. Okay. It's just another, it's like a content or a definition type unit. Okay. So think, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I would almost want to say it's a concept, but yeah, would you? So it's, it's, it is conceptual, but yeah, it's, I, won't, I won't call it a concept per se. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and the reason for that is for differentiation purposes with, with purse. But okay. so think of it kind of like a definition mm -hmm. or a con or like a in Echo's terms, Echo drawing Umberto Echo, who I'll talk about a little bit, he phrases it as signs have what's called an expression plane and a content plane. So okay. the signifier would be very similar to what Echo's calling content, and the signifier would be very similar to what Echo is calling an expression. Echo gets a terminology from, an, from another important semiotician who we won't talk about today, but his name is Louis Helmslev. Um or Jelmslev. I'm not really sure how to pronounce his name. It's spelled H-J, and I'm not how to be sure how to do that. Yeah. So anyway, so that's for Sassur. Now, okay. what, now, very important for Sassur is what is it that allows dog to signify canine, domesticated canine? Okay. You know, what, what is it that allows him to do that? It, it's, it, well, it, ultimately, that relationship is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. It's just a coded convention. Okay, yeah. So now, that, that connecting between the the word and the thing signified is just conventional arbitrary. again, arbitrary, okay. The word phone could just have easily have been the thing word that designates the domesticated canine. Okay, gotcha. So that's very important for him. So therefore, well, what is it that gives signifiers their meanings? Ultimately, it's not just co in light of that, it is co coded convention, but it's also, uh, this is where structuralism come from, comes from. It's okay. the differences that the signs have from one another. One of the ways that I know what the word dog means is I know that it does not mean what phone means. Okay. And phone doesn't mean what bottle means. So think of them like, like a network. Yeah. You've got like all these nodes all over and they're all connected and they're connected. But what makes this node, not this node is it's differentiation. Okay. So it's this difference. Yeah. Not difference, difference. I think, I think I like that. I think I like that. <laughs> well, a lot very... of people, a lot of people thought that they did. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> Seems very lightweight. So, so, well, I'm going to explain to you why a little bit, why, why that model ultimately 
collapses, and okay. it's very problematic. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, now, while Sassur is primarily con concerned with linguistics, those following him are going to take his take this up, and they're going to make this the model for all signs. So they're actually going to now the and, it's, and the, what we see there is that for these semioticians following him is that all signs become conventional because on the dyadic mm. model, the only thing that really connects anything is interpreting subjects, and they only do that because of their conventions. Okay, so you kind of have this collapse between that, the sign and so, the, okay, yeah, so, connecting so relations. Think it, so if we, if we phrase this in terms of meaning, which a lot of semioticians don't like to, but I'll be bold and I'll do it. Um, for thinking of me, what makes what determines the meaning of a sign is how it relates and differs for, to all the other signs within the sign system. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Charles Sanders Peirce, the who has become one of my favorite philosophers to to study and very fascinating, very difficult philosopher to read to. Peirce is also thinking about signs. Peirce, first and foremost, is a logician. He is reading and studying and memorizing logic textbooks at the ages 11 and 12. Oh, wow. Peirce was an outstanding polymath and he was a pro an intellectual prodigy as a kid. But his father was also a very brilliant man, philosopher and physicist, uh, Benjamin Peirce. And um, so Peirce is, is a logician. He is concerned with the, 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 the logic of relations and he is concerned specifically on how logic works. <laughs> so. Peirce develops his theory of signs in light of that and in light of how it is that logic tells us things about the world. Okay, gotcha. Or how it preserves our beliefs about the world. Now, Peirce, whereas Saussure developed a dyadic, now Peirce is not simply just concerned with language. He is concerned with language, but, he's, but he realizes language isn't the only type of signifying thing out there. So Peirce develops a triadic model of the sign. He tries to think, how can I offer a model or a theory of the sign that will actually be a, help me to unify things like medical symptoms and, and smoke, mm -hmm. as well as languages, traffic signals. I mean, traffic signal is another great example of a, of a conventional sign, because if it wasn't for a society or a culture deciding the red light means stop, that there would just be a red light. Mm -hmm. So the person is trying to think of an all unifying fear, a grand unifying theory for signs. Mm -hmm. He okay. thinks that he does this, and I think he's right, by developing a new model of the sign. Whereas the sewer says there's only a signifier and a signified, Peirce is going to say that signs are composed of three elements, like triangles. Mm -hmm. okay. And he calls these different elements that they're composed of representamen, <coughs> which Peirce is, he is nefarious for just inventing his own terminology. <laughs> it's very annoying when you're reading him. Uh -huh. Because um, he doesn't forewarn you that he, he doesn't always forewarn you that he's creating a new word. He just does it. Okay. Um, the representament, uh, which would be what Sassur would call a signifier or what we might today call a sign vehicle. Mm -hmm. The object that the representament or the sign vehicle signifies. And then the interpretant. Again, the representament mm -hmm. is a lot like the sign vehicle. So let's think of it in terms of language. Okay. The word phone, just the, the verbal word, the spoken word, or the written word, whichever. That is the, that is the representament. It represents. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the linchpin for, for Peirce's theory of signs is representation. Okay. Signs represent something else to someone. Signs to represent something else to someone. In some respect or capacity. You know, that's very similar to the definition that I offered. So... Um, the object, it is simply that. It's so like the word phone. This is this this is the what, what that word represents. Mm -hmm. An object in reality. Mm -hmm. Now it's an, that's an important distinction from Sasur already. Because again, the signified for Sasur is not an object <clears throat> in reality. Mm -hmm. It's just a definition, it's just a content, it's another sign. Now Peirce says that there is something, however, that Oh, that mediates the word phone to this phone. Okay. Something, for example, that when I say the word phone, you know that I'm talking about this thing in my hand. Gotcha. And that's what Persh calls the interpretant. And the interpretant, while it's not the exact same thing as Sassur signified, it's very similar to it. Now, the interpretant is like another, it's like another sign. He calls it another sign, an expanded sign. Like when I say phone, you know the definition of what the word phone is, and that allows you to connect mm -hmm. the word phone to what yeah. I'm holding in my hand. Okay, so I'm the interpretant. 
Well, so you're not, you're the interpreter. I'm the interpreter. The, inter the interpretant is that which is in the quasi mind of the interpreter that allows interpretation to happen. Okay. So think of it like this. Um, okay. Let's go back to the, to the, to the analogy of codes. Okay. Um, if I, so now this is, this, this looks more like a dyadic approach, but it, I think it can be extrapolated for triadic approaches as well. Um, our, our culture and our English speaking culture, we encode the word phone, right? To, to represent this, like it, that is partially convention. Mm -hmm. um, that code, that cultural code that we had done that, mm -hmm. well, you know that code too, right? Yeah. So that code is really what's the interpretant. Okay, the code itself. So it's not the process of encoding, it's the code. Right, encoding is, so encoding happens at a cultural level, mm -hmm. depending on the semioticians you talk to. Um, that's for conventional signs. There is no encoding for for not for for natural signs. But now this is important because Peirce's theory again, signs are always representing to someone. If there's not an interpreter, then there's not always a, there's then there's not signification. Gotcha. Now, and now this is important. I I, yeah. I, I want to make sure that I'm catching the the importance of this. Right. So um, I, I want to say this is in John Cyril. Let, let's say like there was a a clump of rocks that fell down a hill and you know the rocks just happened to fall into a place that they said god exists right well that would mean something to me right but let's say we were in mexico and no one around actually spoke english that would just be a clump of rocks that fell down right from a cliff. right so if i if i you know for example if i uh um I'm trying to think of trying to think of a good example um Nothing. So let's say, for example, just the not not written down, just just by <clears throat> verbal expression, okay, just by sound alone, the word nine. In English, nine is talking about the number nine. Mm -hmm. But if I go out, to, if I go over to Germany, and I yell out nine, people are going to wonder why am I telling them no about because mm -hmm. nine in German is no. <laughs> mm -hmm. It signifies that there's a different code coded convention there that makes that verbal expression nine. Now, granted, in, on on paper it's written differently. So, for looking at it, we know they're different words. But if it's just sound, it may not always we may not make that distinction. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So, now here's where this gets really important. So, like with natural signs, a smoke smoke would be a representament. The fire would be uh, the object. But let's say an animal picked up the scent of that smoke. And that, well, will they know from that scent, run. Mm -hmm. That's an example of inter interpretants. In a lot of ways, interpretants instruct us on how to interpret. Okay. So there is kind of like a theory. And here's this, this is the interesting thing about codes. I said there was no encoding in natural signs. That's technically incorrect. There is a coding in signs. It just happens more through evolutionary processes than it does through. Okay. Than social convention. Okay. They're not all not all codes are socially convened. I should say that. So, like for example, you know, through through the through the development through evolution and stuff, animals know when they smell smoke, they need to run. That's a danger to their life, right? Well, that's that's still a type of interpretant. They interpret us on how to and start to react. So, for example, um, to give you another, if I make the if I express the the proposition. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. Mm -hmm. Well, the object of that is going to be the beautiful day outside, as I so understand it. But the interpretant would be, for example, the other sign that appears on the mind that says, I should go outside and enjoy it. Okay. Or it's all, it's the, it's all the contents involved that allow me to make sense and interpret that. Okay. Now, now, the, now the triadic nature of this, what this does, is this allows us to make sense of more types of signs. Now, Peirce, he gets very, um, he gets, he gets very detailed. Uh, he actually develops a whole taxonomy of signs. We can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but those are the two modern, uh, modern fathers of semiotics. And we've talked a lot about that already. Um, um, but those are the two major guys. So now we, today, we typically have two, generally speaking, there are some deviations, but generally speaking, there are two major schools of semiotics. Those affirming a dyadic model of the sign following in the path of Sassur okay. and those who continue to affirm the triadic models and theory following in the line of purse. Okay. And it's interesting because each school is concerned with very different things in semiotics. 
those following Sasur are still very much concerned with language. Actually, structuralism, you've heard of structuralism, yep. that comes out as a result of Sasur's theory of the sign. Mm -hmm. um, Post structuralism ultimately comes from that. Uh, important semioticians in the line of Sasur include Lewis Hemslev, uh, Alger Das Grima, uh, more, more uh, popular, Jacques Derrida, okay. Umberto Eco. Well, I say Echo. Echo is kind of a hybrid between Saussure and Peirce, although his model of the sign is going to represent Saussure more than Peirce's. Uh, coming more out of the Persian school, you have this uh, behavioral psychologist and philosopher, Charles M. Morris, Charles W. Morris. So W or am I'm confusing which one's with, but Charles Morris. Okay. Um, we have uh, Ogden <coughs> and Richards or er, 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 affirmed triadic models of the sign. And probably the most popular today uh, would have been John D. The late John Dealey, who died back in 2017. Okay, so you have really? these two major schools today are the dyadic model, mm -hmm. which is all there is is the sign, and the thing signified, or the the signified, yeah. But this, but it's important to emphasize the thing signified is not an object in reality. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. It's it's a lot like what Peirce's interpretant is. Okay, gotcha. And then you have the triadic models coming out of Peirce, and that you you have to. Summarize that for me. What is the triadic? Yeah, model? so uh, representament, Represent. object, uh, and interpretant. Okay. Uh, it might be might be better. I prefer to talk about them and deal the two. Most semioticians today would call them sign, vehicle, object, and interpretant. Okay, so the thing that does the pointing, the thing being pointed at, and, and then the thing that mediates the pointer and the pointed. Okay, okay, gotcha. All right, mediating relation. Okay, so can we can we move on to question three, or is there anything you else want to cover maybe in that section? Uh, yeah, so one of the so I, want, I do want to talk a little bit about Perse's tri uh, or uh, taxonomy of signs, just because it's actually really important. <clears throat> that was something that that Sassour never attempted to do is come up with a taxonomy of signs. Perse does, and they all have a lot of weird names, uh, but these are important because all and these aren't taxonomy of signs. These are all taxonomies of the of the way the different the way the three components of a sign all work together for a sign to be a sign in the way that it is a sign. Okay. So uh, when we, so again, we have representament, object, and interpreter, sign vehicle, object, interpreter. Sign vehicles are representament. Uh, Peirce develops a trichotomy. It says there's three ways, three, three ways in virtue of what they are that, that a, a representament is a sign. Um, it can possess the same quality for the object that it stands. Okay. In that case, it's a quality. He calls it a quality sign. Uh, a sign can be a one-time existing thing that signifies something else, uh, kind of like an individual. Like for example, if I were to say, "Hey, Nick, uh, I'm I got a business proposal for you. Let's uh, let's let's open a coffee shop together," and I give you this diagram of projected earnings. Well, that diagram mm -hmm. is would be a <clears throat> sin sign. It's an individual thing. Leggy signs are it's the, the representament is a sign by means of some coding some social convention or coded convention. Purse likes to call those laws. Okay. Um, and then there's this. That's the first trichotomy. The second trichotomy. The first trichotomy is concerned with how uh, by means of what a representament is a sign. The second trichotomy is concerned with how representament relate to their objects. Okay. Uh, so he has three of these, and these are the most popular trichotomy he develops called icon, index, and symbol. An icon stands for its object by some way of similarity, be it visual, verbal, mm -hmm. auditory. Uh, so like, for example, um, if some, like, if you look at your dollar bill, there's a portrait of George Washington on it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's an icon. It resembles, it, re it, it represents George Washington by way of being similar in a visual similarity okay. to, to George Washington. An index is a sign that is causally related to its object or directly connected. So like the smoke coming from a fire, okay. that's, a, that's an index. It's, it's caused by the fire, it's directly connected to it. Uh, footprints, if you're out and you see a bear track, that's an index because it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was caused by a bear walking past, mm -hmm. so therefore it signifies a bear came by here. Yeah. Um, your index finger. If I say, "Hey, hey, Nick, pass me that book on your shelf," um, you'd be like, "Which one?" But the point, though, is, is that my finger, by pointing, this is directly connecting mm -hmm. to the book that I would want. Okay. All forms of indexes are like, or that side. 
That's, index is particularly interesting to me in my studies of semiotics because Peirce makes this claim, and I, and I think he's right on this, that indexes the, are the only mode, are the only type of sign object relation that can serve as an evidence for the object's existence. Okay. They don't always, but they can. Just for example, if I if I just draw a pic, a portrait of someone, well, because, yeah. if it's not caused by that person, that doesn't mean that person exists. It could just be a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. you know? The person who drew Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo is an icon of sorts, but it's it doesn't it's not an evidence that Scooby Doo exists. Yeah. Symbols, on the other hand, are like words. These symbols uh, are when a representative relates to its object by way of, of of a cultural convention. Okay. So again, like words are the go-to example for this. Uh, and then we have this, uh, the third trichotomy is the way in which interpretants, um, the types of interpretants, the types of, that uh, the way representative and interpretants relate with one another. Okay. So we have three types of those. The first he calls a ream, uh, which it stands for its object and term-like capacity. Now all, now for all this second, tri this last trichotomy, it's important that uh, by the way, you'll, well, I'll explain this in a second, I guess. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Reams, they stand for their objects in term-like way. So like a common noun, mm -hmm. like dog, person, yep. table, those are all reams. Uh, then he, another one he calls dicky signs or dissents. Uh, these stand for their object as a respect of fact. So propositions are mm -hmm. dissents. And arguments, they stand for their object in respect of some habit or law. So like a modus ponens is a, is a form mm -hmm. of argument. Okay. But some places he calls this a delum or a delum, um, but but no one really calls them that. They just call them arguments. It's also important to, to remember most semioticians today don't use this terminology anymore. They have they have newer terms. <clears throat> They're not replacements. Um, but a lot of this isn't isn't always uh, kept in doing modern semiotics. Okay. Now the reason these these all these these three trichotomies, these nine different little categories, are important is because every single sign participates in all three of these trichotomies. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, let's, let's think about, you know, a paint, a paint swatch mm -hmm. that you would get at Home Depot. Yep. That would be a, rem, a, a rheumatic, iconic quality sign. Okay. <laughs> so it's term-like. It's, it's not a proposition. It's not an argument. It's huh. just red, right? Mm -hmm. So it's rheumatic in that sense. Okay. It's iconic because it stands for the color red by, the, by the, for, for the red paint by way of being similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's an I, now, now all icons are quality signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's, just, that's just the nature of they are. And the reason that it is is because by icons, since they relate to their objects by way of similarity, they, they, by, in order to be similar, they have to possess the same quality. Okay. Similar qualities is that for which they represent. Okay. That's just one example. Um, the Lord's Supper, um, uh, for example, that would be a, uh, if I remember correctly, that would be a, a re yeah, a re a rheumatic, or it could be a Dyson, rheumatic, iconic, leggy sign. Okay. So like these all, these all mix and match in different ways. I guess now, it depends not, if you're a Baptist. Or if you're yeah, a right. okay. Right. So yeah, if you're a Baptist, then you'd say, yeah, it's really more of a of a of a rheumatic symbolic leggy sign. <laughs> okay. Um, but but we don't have to go through all those things. Uh, but every sign now, not 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 just any one. Like for example, you can't pair a quality sign and a symbol. Okay. Can't or a quality sign and an argument. So. Uh, I'll have to find the chart in some too, but there is a chart that shows which ones can with which. So often there's 10 types of signs that don't have them all memorized. Again, because semioticians today just don't really use these categories anymore. But I still think the categories are helpful for helping us get some bearings on the different ways that signs are related. Okay, so let's go to, yeah, if you just briefly tell us, like, why does it matter for the person that's you? Yeah, because I guess this, this, this is semiotics, I can admit, it's very abstract. Yeah. And uh, people can wonder, so what? Well, mm -hmm. so here's why it's important. If all signs are dyadic and they rely on arbitrary convention, then there is no reason to believe that signs such as language ever tell us anything about reality. Okay. I mentioned earlier that the dyad that semiotics, even though it's, we try to be metaphysically deflationary and not import too much metaphysical baggage with that, mm -hmm. it frequently sneaks in. Mm -hmm. Saussure was a nominalist. 
Gotcha. That makes sense. I feel like him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for Sasur, there is nothing that really relates a word to reality. Okay. It's just convention. Mm -hmm. uh, now, here's where it happens, is that Jacques Derrida picks up on that. Derrida picks up and he, and he kind of runs with it. So the thing which the sign signifies is that relationship is just arbitrary. That so the signs don't signify objects in reality, they only signify other signs, like definition, like a definition yeah. type of sign. Yeah. Well, if signs only signify other signs, mm -hmm. then they never really touch upon the real world. Mm -hmm. And if signs are the way in the medium through which all human understanding happens, then if then we don't really have any reason to believe that our understanding is about the real world. Okay. Yeah. We only understand the sign system. Which now, since all now where Derrida and others will, will make radical claims is they'll go to say there is no reality beyond the sign system. Gotcha. So you kind of build like a, I'm sorry. You, so, you, go ahead. You're, they're kind of built like this linguistic grid that is keeping them from actually speaking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, again, when we you know, think back to that, <clears throat> um, to that metaphor of the, the network, mm -hmm. none of the nodes ever connect to the real world. It's arbitrary. Now, since since it's only through that network that we understand any concept of reality, well, Derrida and others are going to say, well, then reality itself is just nothing but a sign. Mm -hmm. Reality is just a word. Yeah. It's just a sign that signifies another sign. We never get outside of the sign system. And, and this is so important because if our signs are what give us understanding of what is quote unquote reality, then that means the structures of our sign system structure our reality. Okay, gotcha. So therefore, reality becomes very subjective. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and this becomes the basis for him for for his atheism, actually. Wow. Okay. So well, because because again, God yeah. the, the God is just a sign that points to other signs. There's because it doesn't touch upon reality. Yeah. It's ultimately arbitrary. Yeah. Um, now there have been some of the dyadic approach, like Echo. Echo is not a theist, but they've tried to rehabilitate to, to maintain a, a grasp on the dyadic model. And rehabilitate some realist concerns that no no signs do help us with reality. Um, I don't think they do so adequately. Okay, gotcha. And so so that's why these matter. Um, now, okay. So I guess explain how Peirce's model saves us from that <laughs> that view. Right. So to understand Peirce's model, we have to understand a little bit about evolutionary theory, which is fun. Um, so what Peirce talks about when we when we think about human development. And this happens in animals too. Uh, let's, let's look at how it does it in animals first, since animals are non-linguistic. So animals typically encode, uh, so every, every animal, every, every individual exists in an environment, right? Mm -hmm. German Umwelt. Now what's an environment? An environment is an area which one lives and thrives or sees safety. Um, but everything that exists in an environment is coded in some way or another. Okay. Typically, they're coded as positive, neutral, or negative. Uh, let's let, let's say that we're talking about a squirrel. Okay. Okay. If a squirrel stumbles upon an acorn or an oak tree, that has positive value. The oak tree can provide shelter. The acorns provide food. There's something to be desired. Okay. Now, here's the thing, though that acorn has now become a sign. It's not just a thing in itself because it signifies survival for that species. It may not do so on a con. Here's the thing, semiotics or semiosis, the process of, of signs and interpretants and, and objects all relating, mm -hmm. these don't have to be consciously be happening. Yeah. Um, hmm. uh, just for, just for example, okay. for, for example, when I, when I, when I get the, the rhino virus for the, for the cold, I don't have to consciously tell my body to, to deploy antibodies to go deal with this problem. My body does that. My body interprets. Mm -hmm. There is an invader. We need to attack it. Yeah. And it okay. sends antibodies. So, so this happens even at molecular level. Symbiosis okay. does. Okay. This, is what, this is what's really fascinating about, about the Persian model. So when we, when we go back to the animal, though, you know, but now say a squirrel comes upon a rock in its environment. Well, the rock's just neutral. It's there doesn't pose a threat, it doesn't pose any benefit. But then the squirrel also in its environment are owls. Now owls, well that's not owls, let's say, let's say hawks. 
Yeah. A hawk. Oh, now hawks are negative. There's something that 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 would prohibit my survival. Okay. I need to avoid those. So the hawk has now become a sign for something negative, the antithesis okay. to survival. Mm -hmm. So so semiosis is happening. Semiosis is just the word again to designate uh, the way that things signify to interpreters and the way interpreters make sense of signs and so forth. Okay. Now so let's think about this for for the human animal. Going all the way back when you know we've got human animals, they don't okay. have language yet. Let's say they don't have language yet. They they encounter fire for the first time. There's no word for fire, but they want to communicate. They want to share this thing. Mm -hmm. So the fire it, it can cook food. It provides warmth. Well, now the fire for this human animal has become a sign. Okay. Sign for it's good for survival. Yeah. Right. Well, so the this this, uh, this humanoid or this, sorry this uh, <laughs> not humanoid this this human animal, um, well now it has this mental image the memory of fire. Okay. But there is no language, so how does the human animal communicate it to another human animal? Okay. He's going to point to it. Yeah. Well now. He has this object. It's become an object for warmth. It's a represent. It's a. It's an icon in his mind <clears throat> because of the similarity. He has the memory. Yeah. And when he thinks of that, he thinks of the positive things, something to be desired. It's a sign. It's already signifying something as an icon in his mind, or her mind. Okay. Now they need to share it, so they point to it. Okay. Well, now indexes have entered the picture. Okay. So they go and they get another human animals. <laughs> That's how they did it. They, well, no, they, they, they do that, and then they start to say things like, they might make <laughs> other hand gestures, like, oh, it's warm, you know, like, they begin to communicate. Well, then what happens? Uh, finally, they, there, there are, let's say that there is some language already. Let's just go ahead and say that there's some language that they share. Well, now this human animal says, they, they, what do they do? They come up with an utterance okay. to represent that thing. Gotcha. Let's say it's, let's just say it's fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, the, the human animal tells the human animal, fire. Mm -hmm. But now what's happened? Now they can discuss it. Mm -hmm. Fire it becomes its it represents now it's a shared sign. This is very important uh, for the person for the person about symbols because they rely on conventional laws, they are shared signs. Mm -hmm. But now here we have a very indirect way that the word fire actually touches upon reality. Okay. Because the symbol, well, what's it representing? When we say fire, what does that represent? It's representing what I'm pointing to. Mm -hmm. What I'm pointing to is representing what's already in my mind. Yeah. This is for warmth. Mm -hmm. And what is that representing? The fire itself. Yeah, so I like this. Scott Scott said, I feel dumb after every new show, after every show. Scott, you're not alone on this, okay? <laughs> We're talking about things that so, advanced studies and theological methods. So, yeah, so if so, I'm, can, can so I just I'll, like, Rephrase oh kind of so, so the the th um, the object comes first, right? And then right. there's the interaction between the object and the interpretant that gives rise to these different uh, referendum. And so, in in a sense, objects can take on significance as they have this this con connection takes place. I actually believe, believe it or not, I actually like to phrase it in terms of, of Christian <clears throat> theology, actually in Trinitarian terms. This is how I like to do it. Because okay. it's actually very interesting the way that these signs relate to one another. Actually, Purse himself acknowledges these parallel the Trinity in every way. Wow. Okay. Okay. Good. So well, before we get into that. Second. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, so think about this. Objects generate representament. Okay. Great. So like when, for example, when I look at a bottle, the word bottle is immediately pops. Like I don't have to think about it yeah. or the image of bottle or what it always it pops in my head, what it <laughs> represents. Yeah. So it generates that. But then what else happens? Again, another sign immediately pops in my head that says good for drinking, whatever. Yeah. It's the encoded interpreter. Mm -hmm. So the interpreters kind of proceed from the object and the representative mm -hmm. into mediation. Gotcha. So okay. I actually, I think that I think the language of the triune processions is actually helpful to clarifying like how this happens. <laughs> but so here's why that's important. Okay. First, is sign by doing that, it shows how actually icons, indexes, and symbols all can connect to one another and it allows our language to actually touch upon the real world. Yep. So when we want to talk about, for example, um, this is kind of getting into question four. <clears throat> uh, where's, not, not question four, um, question uh, seven. 
uh, really, is that they can actually, if we start looking at things like causation, Really, when you think about it, the Kalam cosmological argument, it's a semiotic endeavor. Okay. All things, all things have a beginning. Well, the universe has a beginning. Effects have causes. This is pointing to a cause. Mm -hmm. Effects signify causes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because in fact, that when we look for things like evidence, evidences are signs. Mm -hmm. So when we look at something like like the Kalam cosmological argument, we, we, we make these inferences, like all things that um, begin to exist have a cause, well, the universe began to exist. Mm -hmm. Again, well, this is this is an argument, right? Mm -hmm. But arguments are part of tr Perse's trichotomy of signs, or his taxonomy mm -hmm. of signs. Gotcha. So again, these are signifying things. Mm -hmm. The fact that the universe has a beginning, that it began to exist, so that means something had to have caused it to exist that's beyond the universe. Mm -hmm. These inferences, inferences are, are actually the instances of semiosis. Okay. It's actually, so... And so, and so really, when we begin to look at this, and when we begin to look at how, we can talk about this in a second, but really what I'm getting at is that <laughs> since, since every living organism or every living thing participates in semiosis. Okay. It does. Gotcha. Which is fascinating because if semiosis is taking place in these triune patterns, mm -hmm. then it seems to imply that all of experience seems to be some sort of reflection of God's triune nature. Okay. That creation itself would actually model that. Okay, so let let's get into yeah, some. So, we're going to get into some more concrete ones, and then we'll probably right. come back to something like that. So, so let's talk about some examples that semiotics, uh, uh, examples of problems in theological method that semiotics can help us with. So, yeah, why don't you take us through that first one? Right. So, since the Persian model <clears throat> can help us talk about how language and, for example, conventional science connect to reality, they provide us with a way of affirming theological objectivity. Mm -hmm. So again, before, since if we have the dyadic models, well, since all signs are just arbitrarily con you know, convened by some uh, society or culture, well, there is nothing that really connects them to the world. Yeah. It's just, there's nothing really objects. When I say, for example, the sky is blue, well, I'm not talking about anything in the world mm -hmm. on this dyadic model. Yeah. And, I, and I do think, and here's the thing, I actually think Derrida is right. If signs are diet, and I think things like deconstruction, what he talks about his, uh, his, his theory of trace, of how signs just defer, defer, defer endlessly to something else, and they never actually hit anything concrete at the bottom. And actually, I think he's right. Mm -hmm. But if purses are, tri but if, 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 if signs are triadic, mm -hmm. and they actually do stem from the world, from reality, well, then that's not the case. So whereas before, at best, if we took, even if we took a conservative view of, the, of Saussure's dialogue, what Umberto Eco does, we still never get beyond saying that when I say the sky is blue, I can't really say it's objective because I have no reason for believing those signs touch upon reality. Mm -hmm. At best, it's intersubjective. Gotcha. So the Persis model actually allows us to say, well, if God has created the world in such a way that it would represent that he is, that there is a creator that actually represents him or points to him mm -hmm. or signifies him. Well, now we have an objective basis for that. Yeah. Gotcha. The world does so because our, because our science systems are stemming. <clears throat> but as a result, that gives us a better basis for natural theology, I think. Morality okay. points to God, right? Uh, when we talk about the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection, <laughs> the empty tomb, and the, well, that signifies something. Well, it signifies, well, well, this body should be here, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Someone must have stolen it or something must have happened. Well, then we have these post-mortem appearances to the disciples. Well, the tomb is empty and you're appearing to all of us. We can touch you. Well, this seems to signify that you, that you somehow you're alive again and you're, you're really alive again. Yeah. So we can help with that. Mm -hmm. uh, signs, I think it helps us with theological epistemology. Uh, so one of the things that comes about from semi from semiotics is that we do seem to realize that, that all again all knowledge is mediated, all understanding is mediated through signs. Well, if something is mediated through something, then there's always the possibility that if the sign function is going wrong, then our understanding could go wrong. So I think that for example, when we misunderstand something, what frequently happens is that we misunderstand the way our like through language the way our signs are coded. Gotcha. So like, for example, you know, um, uh, 
trying to think of a good example of this. Um, I, I was just going to say, I mean, like a debate within religious language, you know, I think comes up in the moral argument is when we say God is good, what right. exactly are we saying? Right. If we are operating, operating <laughs> with different. So, by the way, definitions are a type of interpretant, by the way. I don't know <laughs> if I said that earlier, but they are. So, like, for example, we say God is good. Well, how we understand the interpretant of good or the definition of good, well, that's going to affect, we might say, well, no, God's not that. God's greater than that, or God's not good enough to be that, if you know, some atheists would say that, you know. So, again, that's where a lot of misunderstandings come about is through, is through an error in semiosis. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have about uh, probably 10 minutes left, Andrew. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to skip over anything that you think is vitally important. So why don't you just right. jump um, to the parts that you think like, okay, this needs to be said about science. Right. So Hearst developed his theory of science because he was a logician. Mm -hmm. For him, semiotics and logic are two ways of talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Again, this is what led him to the study of science. Now, this is also important too, because on the dyadic model, if everything is arbitrary, then there's no reason for us to believe that modus ponens is true, that modus ponens is the case outside of our own science system. Gotcha. Yeah. It all becomes arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that if we if we take on that view of science, then I think that we do end up where Derrida ends up. Meaning is just a figment of the imagination. That all there that if all there is is this endless deferment, then we're left to what Derrida called play. We're, we're allowed to make meat to create our own meaning. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, we ultimately, since there is no escaping the science system to an external reality, then really we create our own reality. Yeah. Which is absurd because under no reality I might try to create. If I jump off a building, regardless of what my science system leads me to believe, guess what? I'm going to hit the ground. Yeah. 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 And so <laughs> So, <laughs> like so it that. seems to fail on some 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 key points there. Um, as far as further payouts, I actually think, and I've actually got an article coming out, uh, a web article with on the Evangelical Philosophical Society's uh, Philosophy of Theological Anthropology series on their website. Uh, I actually think this has tremendous help for helping us better understand the the image of God. And I've actually got an article on semiotics and the image of God coming out in the journal, the Global Anglican, um, this month or next month. <laughs> And really, I say that by understanding the way signs signify things, well, images are signs, they're icons. Mm -hmm. So how does understanding Peirce's concept of icon and the way icons relate to indexes and symbols, gotcha. how does this help us better understand um, the image of God? In my EPS article, I go further and I talk about the, the examples I gave you of how uh, the, the human animal comes up with the word fire and it points in weird out. Well, by coming up with language, once we come up with language, well, guess what? This allows us, th this is what makes possible um, the construction of social reality. Gotcha. So really civilizations exist because of languages. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Languages gotcha. are just endeavors in symbiosis. It's because we find these coded signs by which we can communicate with one another. So semiotics has extremely, is extremely helpful for explaining so much of the world around us. And, and since every living organism is, is participating in semiosis to some level or another, um, Peirce was picked up on this towards the end of his career. He says, you know, the universe is just simply, simply but it's just perfused with signs mm -hmm. if it's not entirely made up of them. Mm -hmm. So okay. because so really all of reality ends up participating in semiosis, gotcha. which if it is a form of mirror to like say the triune processions or the way the mirrors are painted, and I think this provides us with a very beautiful picture of wow, reality is constantly declaring and pointing to who God is mm -hmm. in an iconic sense in that in that way, at least symbiosis. And the idea of understanding symbiosis and perichoresis actually are very, very they, they parallel one another in a lot of ways. Okay. Um they also can help us, but again, when we think about representation, they can help us better understand the ways in which Jesus represents God to humanity and humanity to God as our mediator. Okay. Can, can we talk about this, this one you have here? Because one of the few things that I've really taken, <laughs> I guess, a liking to is talking about being Baptist. And so whenever I have a chance to talk about something sure. that's distinctly Baptist, I, I want to try it. 
I, so I want to identify that way as much as possible. Help us. How does it help us better understand baptism at the Lord's Supper? Yeah, so I've actually got an article that kind of touches upon this in a little ways, where I use uh, some of Purse's taxonomy of signs to help uh, provide a better approach. So Wolfhart Pannenberg actually takes a somewhat semiotic approach mm -hmm. to the Lord's Supper and baptism in his systematic, following through his systematic theology. But Pannenberg is operating out of a dyadic model of sign, though Pannenberg is a realist and he thinks that the languages do point to actual realities. Um, I don't, his model of the sign actually isn't fit to do that. So I offer the Persian models of per, insights from Persia's taxonomies to try and help with that. So when we think about the Lord's Supper, what does the Lord's Supper do? It's supposed to call us to remember something, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a representation of something. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Lord's Supper is a representation of two things, right? It's a representation of the supper Jesus had with his disciples. That's also a representation of the future supper that we're going to have with the lamb in the eschaton. Okay. That the future, uh, the, so to say, where uh, like another parable where it talks about how you know in in his last days that he will welcome us all in, we'll all be welcome to his table, mm -hmm. kind of that eschatological um, moment. Okay. Supper for lack of better. So the supper points it signifies those two things, but but, but how does it do so? Well. At a very basic level, we can say, well, it's definitely iconic, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, re it's a, it's, there's a similarity of it. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets very interesting. In what ways is it iconic? And this is where Baptist and, and the different denominations are going to differ. Is that now, again, it's iconic. But if it's iconic, then it means it possesses the same qualities of the things that it represents. There is something about the qualities of that future supper and of the past supper that somehow or another are embodied in this. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we want to say that that is also, you know, symbolically, that, that's a different thing. But so one of the things that I think is helpful, and I think that Pandenberg's account is helpful for on this, is that it is obvious that, that signs don't always, some people try to pr prefer to talk about signs embodying meaning, and that's not really what they do. They're, they're pointers. Okay. So the supper is very distinct. So when we say that it signifies Christ's passion, you know, some say that his that Christ is present in the elements. I don't know if semiotics really helps us argue one way or another on that. But I think that it does help us to realize that by, again, because the supper is signifying something else, a memory and a hope. Mm -hmm. And because we are embodying those things, mm -hmm. we are actually participating in those. Mm -hmm. We are participating in what the signs are signifying by, again, the signs don't embody them, we're embodying it. Mm -hmm. So now, whether we want to say that, you know, Christ is actually present in the supper, I don't think semiotics gets us that. Okay. Um, because again, those discussions are over um, the discussions that like Luther and the Reformed tradition and, and Zwingli were having, those aren't really issues about, you know, how, are, how is the supper signifying or pointing, but they're talking about substance issues. Gotcha. And semiotics isn't that. It's not a metaphysical theory. Mm -hmm. But I think it does help to say that even if it is, let's just say it was only a symbol. Mm -hmm. Well, the symbol is not just a pure symbol because it is an icon, mm -hmm. which means that there is something deeper that it does represent what is by way of resemblance. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it means it's possessing qualities mm -hmm. of that which it resembles. So in so that we partake in those things, we are to some extent embodying those qualities. So there is an actual participation going on mm -hmm. at the supper. And I think baptism is a similar thing. Mm -hmm. You know, baptism, again, it, it signifies being buried with Christ and being raised in him again. That it's it's embodying particular qualities mm -hmm. about something that happens with that. Okay. Now again, the metaphysics behind that semiotics doesn't aim to yeah. do that. But I think that it does help provide us with deeper ways of understanding about how. Yeah. Maybe it's not just a hard and fast distinction. Mm -hmm. There can be an actual participation of Christ, even if it's symbolic, like on the Baptist view. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the Reformed view. Mm -hmm. It might be the case it's a Reformed view, but again, semiotics isn't going to give us the answers to the substance questions. Good, good. One of the areas that I would be interested, in, and and we're going to have to uh, cut out. I got Malcolm Yarnell coming on at eleven fifteen, and we're going to be mm. talking about free church. Uh, approaches to theology. So we got two two episodes of theological method today. Um, nice. But uh, 
Man, I, I, I would be interested uh, what you think on uh, some of the discussions going around on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. And, and now, I mean, obviously the Old Testament use of the Old Testament itself, because there's a lot of things that I think parallel what you're saying about signs, um, taking on significance or embodying or participating, that uh, I think could be helpful in clarifying some of the issues of New Testament use of Old Testament. Text. Yeah, there, there's actually some some good work out there um, that's been done, that's being done on that. There's actually a lot of use of actually, fun fact, uh, Julia Kresteva, the, 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 the post-structural uh, semiotician who coined the term intertextuality, was a semiotician. So actually, intertextuality came out of semiotics. Wow. Um, so when we, or at least the studies of intertextuality, the way we, the way people use text and interpret them and use them and stuff like that. So if you want some good resources on that, uh, Stefan Alcair, S-T-E-F-A-N, Alcair, A-L-K-I-E-R, he has taken up uh, echoes and Persis semiotics. Mm-hmm. He has used those to analyze the resurrection discourses in the New Testament mm-hmm. to talk about how those point, the, the, as a result, they, how they can function as evidence of the resurrection. Leroy Hyzenga, he's a Catholic theologian. Um, I forget where he's at, but he uses insights from echo semiotics to look at how particularly Matthew uses the Isaac narratives as a, mm-hmm. uh, to understand Jesus through the Isaac typology. Um, there was a graduate from New Orleans, Justin Langford, Okay. I don't know if you knew Justin. He's up at Louisiana College now. He used uh, some of the semiotics uh, developed by Stefan Alkir, uh, who's drawing from Echo and Purse to illuminate First Peter's used to be Old Testament. Okay. Uh, yeah, I forget the name of his book. I There's think I do book. remember meeting him at one point. Mm-hmm. If you go on Amazon, just look up for Justin Langford semiotics or something like that, or First Peter, then you'll mm-hmm. uh, you'll find his book. Uh, actually, some biblical scholars are the first and the quickest ones to jump on semiotic theory as a means and ways of trying to delve into theories of intertextuality and okay. textuality. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a good one. As far as systematic theology contributions or, or works with se- semiotics, I, I'm actually one of the very few who do that. Not many do that. Uh, <laughs> the people who have are Michael Raposa in his new, new book, Theosemiotic. Uh, and probably the one that I find the most benefit from his name is Andrew Robinson. He has a great book called God in the World of Signs. And he has another book since then um, called Traces of the Trinity. And he looks at how through evolution, um, through human experience, through the Imago Dei, through the suffering baptism, the triune God is actually seen to have been pointed to. And he actually uses Persis semiotics as a way of understanding and phrasing a deification. Good, good. Uh, Andrew, theosis, sorry. Good, good. Andrew, where can people find you if they want to see what you're up to? Uh, so I'm on Twitter, though. I've tried to take a little bit of a step back from Twitter. I am there. I tweet uh, at Theology Blues, um, capital T, capital B. Um, I have a website, jandrewhollingsworth.com. I need to do better about updating it. Uh, most of my articles that I've had published are in uh, the journals, uh, the German journal Neue Zeitschrift for Systematic Theology and Religions Philosophy. They print, my articles are in English, so you can find them in English. I don't have to write them in translate or anything. Uh, the, there's an Anglican journal called Churchman uh, that has recently changed its name to the Global Anglican. Uh, those are the main art place where I pu- publish my articles. Uh, you mentioned my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's with Wittgenstock. It's right uh, here, on, guys. Right here. I'm on Facebook. Um, those are, I guess, those are really the main the main places yeah. um, you, to find me and my stuff. Now you're on YouTube. I don't. I don't I'm not. I'm not a, now I'm on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned my my podcast with the London Lyceum. Um, yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. Uh, I've. Uh, I mean, I, I used to try to blog, but I don't. I don't really do that. I found every time I started sitting down to write a blog, I thought, man, I really think that I feel like I should be working on like a new article for peer review or something so yeah I, I found with blogs that they have to be very useful <laughs> you know it has to be something that somebody's like oh i could use this in the next few minutes you know they they do and blogs blogs really thrive w- when you're popular uh-huh. and uh i haven't really reached popularity yet maybe your youtube channel will get me there Who's yeah there? yeah well this is the exclusive place to find andrew hollingsworth on youtube guys don't <laughs> right. uh, i'm gonna do an outro for the youtube channel we'll still be on a zoom uh, guys, don't forget to buy Andrew's book right here, God in the Labyrinth, or Labyrinth, um, and also find him wherever you can find him. 
Don't forget to also subscribe to the channel, guys. We have 306 subscribers. So come on, give yourself a round of applause if you're already subscribed. Uh, share the content um, to any theology geeks and nerds that you know who think that this stuff is cool to talk about. And also, uh, don't forget to click any of the links in the description if you want to support me in furthering my education and also uh, in talking with people like Dr. Andrews Hollingsworth. You guys have a blessed day.